Hey everyone, I'm going to do some calibration work. Now my Siglent STM3065X here, I've had this for a few years now, it's shut off a little bit. Now there is actually a factory calibration procedure, you can do a recalibration. It's At the moment it's secret, no one really knows about it, it's very um, hush hush, I mean it's out there, but it's only disclosed to people under certain circumstances, it's a bit secretive. I expect in time that will change, and when it does change I'll be able to publish this video. So I'm recording the video ahead of time. When it does get allowed, then I will release a video to public viewing so everyone knows how to do a recalibration on this meter. And there's similar ones as well, like the 3045 and the 3055 as well, right? Ones that run the same firmware anyway. So there is actually a process for this. It is a bit involved, there's some paperwork, and to be honest, the writing on the paperwork isn't that clear. There's a bit of Chinglish involved there, some words are wrong, that kind of thing. If you're really focused on it, you can figure out what it actually means, but it's not particularly clear. We go through, and I show you my setup here, how I'm going to do it, go through the process with you, and you can get an idea. I won't do every single calibration, but I'll do, I'll do the DC volts range, okay? I'll just do that one, and that'll then give you an idea of how to do all the other modes as well, like AC, the current, resistance, stuff, stuff like that. Same principles apply. Once you actually have an understanding of how to do it, you understand, oh, it's actually pretty easy. There's a few gotchas in there. There's some things you have to be really careful about making sure you do right. Very important. Probably the most important thing. Maybe not so much when you're doing the very first calibration. Once you've done a calibration though, if you want to go back and redo it because you want to tweak a bit more or something like that, you always have to be really careful how you do this. So what you've got to be really careful about is making sure that when you're doing calibration, that you start off from the factory calibration. So if you do shift, utility, System setup, calibration, it says factory here, that's the one that's currently selected. Now if you've got a previous calibration, you can switch to user calibration instead. Right? You can see that my numbers just jumped down slightly here, because I've done this calibration process before, a while ago. That needs redoing. You have to make sure you always start with the factory calibration, otherwise what will happen, the readings you're getting, when you do the corrections, won't actually be correct. Because it will be shifting from the factory calibration reference points to the one you're adjusting to. But if you're using the user calibration, it'll be giving you a different reading for what you actually expect. The shift amount won't be correct. So you always have to make sure that you start off with factory calibration, you're on that mode there first before you do any readings. This meter here isn't accurate, or oh, that's closer. I also have my Solotron down here too. You think, oh, it's, you know, 3, 1, 3, 7, it's not far off, 3, 4. Well, actually, there's another zero in here. So when you've got a bunch of meters in parallel, you have to be really careful about how you do this. I mean, I've got three meters here in parallel. The input impedance is then obviously paralleled up, so you've got much higher loading on your source. Now if you're not doing a star supply, like I've got all three leads here going down to one point on the output of my calibrator. So that means I've got a, a more accurate system. If I was to do a daily chain, one to the next, the next, the next, then you would potentially be getting different readings as it goes along the chain. But because I've got them down back to the same point, it should be a bit more accurate. If you are watching this reading up here and unplug this meter, unplug the Solitron, you see the reading doesn't change. If I unplug the HP, the reading basically doesn't change. Right? So the loading in this case is insignificant. It doesn't actually affect what I'm doing. But it's something you would have to consider normally is that making sure that if you've got stuff paralleled up like this, you're not creating a situation where you're misreading the values. I've only really got the Solotron here and the HP running just as reference, just to show you what's going on. You know, rather than just looking at this one meter alone. You can see the calibrator is currently set at 10 volts output. This is my Datron 4700. It does all the calibrations, AC, DC, current, resistance, does a whole lot. I've got a PDVS2 Mini here, I've got it set at 10 volts. This has been on for about 4 hours it's been on for. And everything else here has also been on for at least 4 hours. You want to make sure that your gear is fully warmed up, fully stabilised. The temperature in this room right now is 23.1 degrees C. Humidity is 53%. So let's plug the PDVS2 Mini in instead. This is also output in 10 volts as I showed you. And you can see that the PDVS2 Mini is agreeing with my calibrator down here. The upper voltage is the same. So that means my 10 volt supplies are identical. So I can trust this calibrator, I can trust my PDVS2 Mini. You should always do a little verification if you can. Sometimes you'd be a slight deviation, but in here they're like basically identical, which is brilliant. 
So if you have a PDVS2 Mini or PDVS2, then you could use that to do the lower voltage calibrations. Obviously, because it only goes up to 10 volts, you can only do up to 10 volt calibration, which means you can do 200 millivolts, 2 volt range, and you can kind of do the 20 volt range, but it's not ideal doing a calibration point in the center of the range, you should be doing at each end. Yeah, I wouldn't recommend it, but if you've got no other choice, that's the only thing you can do, then okay, it might be more accurate than we've currently got. To do this calibration, you basically have to the manual range it, and you go through each range. Now, there is a spreadsheet you have to fill in, well, it's actually a CSV file. There's some tricky things about that as well. I'll tell you about those now before I forget. Should I get a bit shorter things? So um, yeah, look at my shirt. You couldn't get these yourself, too, if you like, in my merch store. When I first did the calibration work on this thing myself, nearly two years ago now, when I first had access to the information. When I did the spreadsheet, I did it all on my Mac. Now, the thing with doing it in Excel on a Mac is that the line endings aren't correct. And what will happen if you try and then save it a CSV from Excel, maybe some other programs too, I'm not quite sure, and then you put that in the flash drive, put it in here, this won't accept the file. It'll say it's no good. I can't remember exactly what the error message was now, but I couldn't get it to work. I did it on a PC, it was fine. I think I found a trick, and I'm going to demonstrate some information on my computer when we get to that. I'll show you the code. I can actually show you the hex values and stuff like that of the file, so you can see what I'm exactly what I'm talking about in a more technical way. It's basically to do with the CRLF line endings. Instead of CR or LF, Windows has CRLF, whereas Mac won't be like that. Potentially, unless you have your file set up right. So I'm going to show you something on there anyway. So that's a little thing. If you're doing the Excel files, you have to make sure you're saving on a PC or you make sure the line ending is correct and there's no extra garbage inside the file. This is very, very touchy about the file being valid. If the file doesn't look valid, it will ignore it, which is a good thing because it means you won't screw up your calibrations. There's one spreadsheet for each mode. There's also multiple modes. Say, for example, DC volts here, we've got auto zeroing. These meters actually treat auto zero as a separate range. So if I turn auto zero on, it shifts it. So it treats it as a separate mode. So you have to do the DC volts calibration mode, you do all that spreadsheet, and then you've got the auto zero one, you repeat the process again for the auto zero. And you can see here there's actually an offset between the auto zero and the other one in the standard mode. Now if it's all correct, it should be the same. One other thing we do, we make sure the relative is not turned on. You don't want any corrections being implied right now. You shouldn't have to do that. This should be raw data as it meter sees it. You base it off that. You don't do any corrections now. Power line cycles, we've got to set the 10 power line cycles, which should be adequate. I mean, we could do one, I mean, it's been a bit quicker and the value doesn't really change that much. But if you're doing lower levels or high resistances, then you need to make sure that the aperture is big enough to uh, accommodate noise. I'd say use 10 because it's good enough to be accurate and not too slow. So let's say we're going to go through the actual calibration process. The calibrations are done for millivolts all the way up to 1000 volts. So I'd say 200 millivolts, 2 volts, 20 volts, 200 volts and 1000 volt ranges. That actually has a negative and positive value. There's two lines in the CSV in the spreadsheet there and the first line is negative the second line is positive and you have to put in data of the actual measured value what's coming out of your calibrator and the actual value on screen so it's called measure and show now show is what's on screen measure is your calibrator output this is kind of accurate but it's not 100 percent there all right this is not right it's close but it's not 100 percent my calibrator i trust completely I, I really do believe that the output on this is is good although I haven't had it officially calibrated bear that in mind but it matches my PDVS2 mini and anything else I've done to do verifications it's matched so I'm very very confident that my calibrator has a good output and it's accurate without actually going through a formal calibration process which costs thousands let's go through the process first thing we need to do is drop the calibrator down to a range where we're going to be wanting to do it I'm also going to remove one of my test instruments here because I'm going to be doing lower levels stuff like that this is just here for reference only, just so you can see kind of what's going on, just to see that this is drifting off by quite a bit, as you can see. I'm going to disconnect my Solotron. I'm going to take that out of circuit, pull the plug straight from the output of the calibrator. So there's no cables attached, inducing noise, that kind of thing. So that is now only this meter and this meter connected up to the calibrator output. The first step is to do a negative 200 millivolts calibration. So first I'm going to do a negative. On here it's just a button push which is swaps it around which is quite nice and here you can see that negative 100 millivolts is actually fairly close 
and this is obviously stabilising because you know things sort of around us like to give a stabilising time. Two two is the maximum, like the really top end. So that's what the calibrator is putting out right now. It's point two two volts, and you can see this meter is saying yes, that's looking pretty good. If I turn the filter on, it'll get a lot better. What I've done filtering on there. I'll do a power line cycle, set the ten to power line cycle, same as it is on this. But this was a bit noisy because I don't have the filter turned on, just so you get faster readings. But you can see this is really close. Okay, so that's no, one microvolt or so with noise. But this is three microvolts, four microvolts lower. You think that's not much, so is it? But it's still not right. You want to correct this. You just specify which value you've got when you actually do the calibration on in the uh, spreadsheet. So what I'm going to do for the sake of simplicity is I'm just going to use 200 for everything, right? So 200 millivolts, 2 volts, 20 volts, 200 volts. I have to be careful with this because this cannot do more than 300 volts. So I must make sure that when I go to high ranges, I unplug this thing, or as I'll potentially blow up this meter. So the 200 millivolts, and here we go, we're getting around 200 in here, so, you know, a bit of noise and stuff like that induced into it. If I were to turn the filter on, you will see it will stabilise a lot and get a lot better. So that's now saying 0.8 microvolts. That's the reading we should be basically getting at least, but we're not a fair way off that. I'm just going to base the readings on my, my calibre output. So two, minus 200 millivolts, so in the spreadsheet, the CSV file for the calibration for the DC volts, so it's called DC voltage recal is the actual file name. In column C, row 2, where it says mesh underscore data 1, that is where you put in the output from the calibrator. Okay, so in my case, I'm putting out exactly 200 millivolts, or negative 200 millivolts. So in there, and it's all based on voltage, so its reference level is a volt, so therefore you put in minus 0 0.2, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. I don't know, chucking six zeros after the two, whatever. Nothing really matters, but do it anyway. So that is your measured data one, right? So that's the actual calibrator output. Now in the next cell over, which is column D, show data one, that is where you put in this value, right? So it knows that it's offset by that much. Now you can also see I've got 10 meg input here. Of course I do 10 gig input. In this particular range, it does basically nothing. It's nice to actually have that when you do manual ranging in these low levels. It doesn't matter. As you can see, I changed it, it didn't really do much. I'm not really worried about it. Now I'm going to jump around. The next cell over should be zero volt settings. We're not going to do those yet. What I'm going to do is do the positive one. Because all I've got to do is push one button on the calibrator and it swaps over to positive, which means it's a bit easier for me to do this calibration. Next column over in column E, on the next row down, row three, there's measure data two, or mesh data two, and show data two. You repeat the process, so measure data 2 is you put in the calibrator output, which is plus 200 millivolts, so it's 0 0.2, lots of zeros. And then in this column over in column F, the show data 2 is where you put in this reading. That's then your negative 200 millivolts and positive 200 millivolts calibration points put in there. But it still needs to have a zero reference. So, what the documentation for Siglant actually recommend in this particular instance is a zero point set of about minus two millivolts and plus two millivolts respective to the range. We need to go back and do the negative first, or else like to do negative ones first, so we do negative first. I need to downrange this. Now I can actually do two millivolts on my calibrator, no problem, right? So I'm now doing minus two millivolts. So in this case, we want to go to column E, row two, which is measure data two, or measure data two, we put in 2 millivolts, which is going to be, well, minus 2 millivolts, so it's minus 0 0.002 and lots of zeros. Wherever your current source it will be, in my case it is 2 millivolts exactly, so we'll just put in that number, assume exactly the right value. If you have a more accurate reference you can use to check the actual measurements, like a 3458A for example, then you would use whatever that unit says to be your true reference. And then in column F, in row 2, show data 2, you put in the value you've got on here, which is going to be minus 0 0.002, uh, 0032 in this case, right? That's what you put in there. Don't forget, it's all reference to one volt, not what's on screen, one volt. So you have to think about it in voltage terms. If you don't do that right, you'll get a bit screwed up by that. Now we have to flip this around to the positive one. So let's do positive 2 milliwatts, and now we go down to the positive side, which is column C, row 3. Measured is going to be 0 0.002 with lots of zeros in my case, or whatever your reference voltage is in your case. And then you would put in this value in the same format, as in voltage format. So it'd be 0 
0019967 for example that is the first calibration point now that sounds like an awful lot of work for one range but that is what you've got to do and once you've actually get into it and you get used to it it's actually pretty straightforward now another thing you can do to speed this process up once you've got a reference point of a voltage that you're going to use so in this case I'm doing 2 millivolts. Now if I go up to 20 millivolts, that is the recommended minimum for the next range up. So if I do the next range up, so 2 volt range, I could then do the same process on the, the zero ring for the positive 2 volts and the negative 2 volt range for those reference points. Okay, so 2 volt zero, or minus zero, is going to be minus 0 0.02. So I'm actually not too far off on that one. And the same for the positive side, I'll do positive and you'll do the same for that one and then you can do the, up, the upper ranges as well so I actually found it easier to do all the zero points first go through all the zero points because then you're stepping up by range by range really quickly, it's a bit quicker to do that way and then go in and fill in all the blanks with the actual upper limits of those ranges so you know like 200 millivolts, 2 volts, 20 volts so on okay plus and minus as we discussed and that's basically the process so I'm going to show you the spreadsheet now and go through the manual I'm actually going to do a calibration, I'm going to show the whole process because it does take a long time. I've given you the example of how to do it and I'll do the process myself and then we'll go through the spreadsheet and the manual or the documentation that comes with this procedure which like I said isn't particularly clear but that's why I've done the video. So I'm going to get the calibration points, put it in the spreadsheet, we'll do that together and then you'll see the whole process on the spreadsheet which makes it a lot clearer. So here we are, this is the manual for doing this calibration work. So as you can see this is the introduction to it. There's two manual parts for this, well, two booklets, I suppose. The recommended description of the calibration point selection. This is the first bit I was talking about before, about where we do the calibration points. Now, there may be an updated version of this, but it's basically trying to explain about the calibration points in here. And these are the reference points. So negative on this row, positive on this row, and same for each range, okay? This is obviously DC voltage and DC voltage is ultra zero. These are the recommended points, which is what we used. And 1000 volts as well, just off the bottom of the screen, of course it is. That's what we've done. I did those calibration points. I've set those voltages to those lef reference levels on my calibrator, measured those references. Uh, what I did, I was actually went through and took photographs of each one. So I'm just going through, look at the photos and put that data in. It's just a bit quicker and easier that way. So that's that book there. And it does mention about the AC voltage and AC voltage 3 hertz points as well. This is only goes 750 volts because it's the peak voltage of AC. Same for DC current, AC current with a 3 hertz, 2 line resistance, and 4 line resistance. It's, these show milli ohm. I think it actually means mega ohm, not milli ohm. It's a mistake. <laughs> yeah, you think they get that right. Anyway, that's that part. Then over here we've got the second part of it, which is telling you how to do the spreadsheet. So down here it references the file names. These are the different file names. Each spreadsheet or CSV file as it actually is, these are the different file names for each calibration reference. So these are the files you modify to calibrate that particular mode. So as it says here, as I've also mentioned, if you only want to calibrate one mode, that's the only spreadsheet or CSV file you have to provide. If you say if you want to only calibrate DC volts, but you want to leave your AC volts alone, just don't do that one. Just don't do it, run a calibration. That's that's fine. You don't have to install it. This is a snapshot of the spreadsheet. I'll show you the spreadsheet in a second. We we'll go through it. But as you can see, it says fixed head immutable. So these are the unchangeable parts. You do not change these. These are what the multimeter references when it's looking at the calibrations. And these are the bits you change here, so measure data 1, show data 1, measure data 2, show data 2. And it's got that for each row. First row is negative values, second row is positive values in this case. And this is where we get some chinglish going on here. So we've got 20 volts as gear identifier, which actually means range identifier, range. DC volts calibration, so what you're actually trying to calibrate. And starting point and ending point, so starting here, ending there for negative and positive ranges. And there's a whole bunch of description about how to use this, but I think my way of explaining it is just far simpler, so we'll, we'll show that soon. I'm not going to read this out to you because it's just, it's confusing. Once you've got the calibration file done, you put it onto a flash drive, put it into the unit, and then you can load the calibration file. And you go into the file system, so you go utility, menu, which is shift and dual, manage files, and you click on action over here, that button. So you click on that one, and this lets recalibrate. 
that then takes you to another mile system so there's the recalibrate there then you browse find the one you want to do on in the menu system so you choose which one you have to do one at a time okay so each one you do you have to load in manually you can't just do like the whole flash drive you just load each calibration file in as required so you choose it you do selection and you do perform recalibrate as it shows you here and then it'll say are you sure well yes you probably are and if it all goes well it will say it was successful if there's a file problem like if you're trying to save this on a mac and you got the wrong line endings for example as happened to me when i first tried this then it will give you a warning it will say it didn't work in which case you either chuck onto a pc and save it on a pc or modify the file in a text editor which can handle all the correct line endings or a hex editor even now i've got a hex editor i'll show you that in a minute and that's basically it this is just a description of how to do it all i'm going to cover this in more detail anyway myself and there's an example here so that's the calibrator output that is the value recorded on screen and then like, when you fill all that out it will know what to offset by at those points and redo its linearity and stuff like that so these are quite interesting files when this video goes public these files i'd imagine will be available as well i expect they will be i hope so because you know i'm showing you them <laughs> so you go into the utility menu which is shift which is shift dual go into utility system setup which then brings you into this menu with a screen and then you do calibration you click on that button there to do factory or use the calibration then you can choose which one you want to do now you can switch between these at any time at least at the moment you can you can always revert back to your factory calibration and when you do that you don't lose the user calibration it stays there you don't have to worry about losing it and have to do it again once it's in there it's in there it stays there but if you have to do a recalibration as I was saying before you have to make sure you go in select factory calibration first because if you don't do that your offsets will all be wrong because it will be offsetting against the factory calibration not the existing user calibration so if you're already using a user calibration and you try and recalibrate off the user calibration what you end up with will be wrong it will offset by the wrong amount it just won't be right it won't make sense if you go back to factory calibration before you do the calibration and actually do those measurements then it will be okay it will work properly there's a little thing which will catch you out if you're not careful if you're doing multiple tunes for example you know if you're calibrating you didn't quite get it right and you want to go back and do it again that kind of thing and if you don't have a calibration it will just show you the screen like this just saying factory calibration only that's that document so here is the spreadsheet well one of them which is a csv file if i actually open this file up as a csv i'll have to look at that later on i'll show you afterwards so this is just a csv file but obviously excel can handle csv files and this is the way it formats it as this layout you can do it in a text editor instead there's no reason why you can't as long as you've got the correct line endings and it'll work that's the important thing because otherwise you put it into the meter and it will just refuse to accept the file so here we have measure data show data so in these cases here i need to fill in all this information now always work on a copy of the files right so don't mess up the original files that you've been provided make sure you always work on a copy because if something goes wrong with the line endings or the file format or something like that and it gets screwed up you have to try and get another copy right so always work on a copy of the file so i created a duplicate folder renamed the folder for this calibration of this date then i know what i'm dealing with and i know it's that calibration on that day i did that calibration and this is the data i got at that time measure data in this case is going to be minus 0 0.2 we have lots of zeros okay and it's going to be rounding and stuff but don't worry about that this one here is going to be minus 0 0.002 with lots of zeros okay so i'm going to pre-fill some of the data first like the stuff which i know is the measurement data so i know what calibration points i'm looking at and then i'll fill in all these other things here so i shall come back once i've done that well as you can see i've put in all the data here for these measurement points so these are the ones we actually generated the voltages at here and here now i do have all the zeros in here right but excel's taken them out because it's way smaller than them, apparently excel i don't like excel anyway if you're doing this in a text file instead you wouldn't have to worry about that but excel stripped them out probably doesn't matter anyway i think the meter will probably deal with it but we'll see i might have to fix this formatting later on so here we have the show data which is where we need to put in these values we'll be getting so i've got the photos here ready to go you can see it just here this is the zero point so it's minus two millivolts so this one here so what we need to do is put in here minus 0 0.002003 as it is on screen so that should be the correction for the minus 200 millivolt range zeroing now go to the next one which is the positive one which is over here 
So I'm going to do the zeros first, then we'll go through and do all the upper end of the scales. So this will be 0 0.0019966. That's that one. And I'll go to the next one. This is the 2 volt range you can see on screen there. So 2 volt, 0 point, which is this one, minus 0. So it's minus 0 0.02004. Next one is going to be the positive side, this one here, which is going to be 0 0.019997. So just carry on, do that for all those points, and then I'll come back after I put those in. Alright, so that's all those in there, bottom end of each range. Now I'm going to do all the maximum scales. So minimum scales done, maximum scales will be next. So now we're going to do minus 200 millivolts, which is this one here. So again, you've got to do minus 0 0.2 voltage reference based. So it's based off 1 volt. So there we go, we're going to do that. That's what we're going to put in. So that's four zeros. Four zeros, yep. So now we're going to do the positive end. So select the photo for that. There's the positive end. 0 0.1999974. That's that range. So now we're going to do the next one, which is the 2 volt range. Minus 2 volts. So that is minus 2.000039. And the next one is 2 volts. So it's 2.000032. 20 volt range, which is minus 20. So it's minus 20.000048. Plus 20. You can see it's changing digits there as so I took the photo. So 20.000, I'll call it 49. 200 volt range. This is why I did photos because it's far quicker to do it this way. Much easier to look at. So minus 1999784. Oh, I forgot the decimal point. 199. I thought I'd put it in the one. So minus 199784. And the positive is 199.9782. Then the 1000 volt range is minus 999.898. And the positive is 999.898. Nicely balanced that one, isn't it? Just wrong. So that's what I've done. All right. So those are the calibration constants for the DC volts range with auto zero turned off. Now we still got to do this for auto zero turned on. I'll go and do that. Then I'll come back. All right. So I filled out all the auto zero mode versions. So these are all done. You can see I've actually changed the spreadsheet this time to be seven decimal places. So I've made it a number format. Made it seven decimal places. Just to make it clearer to see what's actually going on here instead of that this shortened version. That's that range done. So that means once we get these files onto the multimeter and installed, the DC calibration will be complete. Assuming I did it right. I've got some stuff to show you first about these file types and these issues that these have. So I'm going to show you that now. So let's just show you what I'm talking about with these file types. So this file here, so this DC voltage recal, which is the original file, and you can see I don't even see these line endings on here, it's really faint. But that's it, there's no gibberish on there, it's just fine. It does line endings, that's normal. No trailing commas, that's all fine. So here's the file I just saved with the values in it. And you'll see we've got this trailing commas over here. So that's added that in, which might cause problems. And the roundings are also not there, like minus 10. That should be minus 10 point, lots of zeros. Because that's what I put in. It's not there. So that's an Excel issue. Now if I hide that, over here is a couple of files being viewed in the hex editor. So this views the hex of the ASCII file. I've actually got this wrong around. This makes more sense. So over here is the original file, unedited. If I highlight that bit there, which is the carriage return, we've got 0D, 0A. 0D is hexadecimal for a carriage return. 0A is hexadecimal for a line feed. So the original file has got a carriage return and line feed after that bit there. Now that is the first line of the file before it wraps around and starts doing natural values and stuff like that. That's what the original file's got. This is the saved file. So obviously you've got the commas and stuff sitting there. There's the same blank space where it does the return. And in this case, they're actually there. Because I actually saved this as a Windows CSV. If I saved as a Mac CSV, that wouldn't be there. In fact, I'll do that now. Standard CSV. So here's the Mac version. I open it up. This is the Mac CSV version. So this should be equivalent to this one, right? Let's just make it a bit wider. Here we go. 
So if I put this one above the other, you can see there's a minus digit here. If I highlight that gap, it should be the return. We've only got 0D, and 0D is carriage return. There's no line for your character. So that's the difference between the Mac version and the Windows version of CSVs. So you have to watch out for that for a start. So this is why I'm explaining about this file formats being a bit tricky. You have to make sure, if you can do it on a PC, that's great. I don't know if the multimeter actually cares about these trailing commas or not. I will find out. I'm going to put these files into a flash drive. We'll put it in there, see if it will read them. If it doesn't read them, we'll edit the file in a text editor, take the commas out, and try again. And when you believe it, my calibrate just decided to start playing up. I think I know what it is, but I've seen this exact same fault before. It's shifted off by a bit. Kind of annoying, so I can't really check the accuracy exactly now. Ugh, typical. All right, so let's have a look, see how this goes. I've turned off my main calibrator now. I'm using the PDVS2 Mini. The only thing we're looking at here is a comparison. We know the PDVS2 Mini is accurate anyway, so that's fine. We need to load the flash drive in. Let's recognize the flash drive. So we need to go into Utility. I'm making out that reading we're getting now. Utility. Manage File. Action. Recalibrate. Browse. You want to do external memory. Lower directory. So I need to bring it down to calibration for today, just here. I should do lower directory. So the dot files, of course, that's the thing that Mac does. Ignore those. Okay, so we're going to do DC voltage recal A. Select. Perform recal. Are you sure? Yes. Successful recalibration. Yes, great, it accepted the file. Brilliant. That's good. So even though it had those trailing commas, it didn't bother it. So now we're also going to go back in and do the other one, which is the auto zero recal. So that one there, auto zero, select that. Perform recalibrate. Am I sure? Yes. Accepted that one as well. So yes, you want to switch to it now. Which will come out of there. And injecting one volt, so the auto zero is off. So one volt going in, it's basically bang on. Auto zero on, basically bang on. Okay, don't forget this was based off the Dactron calibrator, so the PDVS2 might be very slightly lower. But as you can see, one volt, there we go. So if I go up to 10 volts on this thing, go to 10 volts on there, or 20 volt range. As it's in the middle of the range, it can be harder to get right. Because it's not at the ends, the ends are the most accurate spot. Auto zero off. So they're basically given auto zero on and off, are given the same reading between the two. That's good, at least that means it's accurate in that way. Now, obviously, the linearity is something which you have to think about on this one. So if I go down to say 2 volts on this range, it's bang on. Go to the next range down, 2 volts is basically bang on. Not much in it. So this is now two weeks later, I finally got my calibrator fixed again, so now we can carry on with where we were. So I wanted to verify that the user calibration before and after were correct. Right? So we already showed you that part, the process, and working out the calibration points and that sort of stuff. I showed you all that. Now I want to cover the verification, because you need to make sure it actually works. This has been on for, I don't know, probably about two and a half hours probably. It's not quite warmed up yet. This has been on for about five hours. These have only been on for about two and a half hours because I've been fixing this thing. It's been off and on before that as well, so it's not completely cold, but two and a half hours, it should kind of be enough to at least verify that we're kind of right. It is pretty stable, it's not really changing much now. I'm on user calibration now. Let's go back to utility, system, user calibration, factory calibration. So there we go. So this is what we kind of had before. 24 counts high with 10 volts exactly from the calibrator. I've also got these here just for reference in case I've got any other faults with the calibrator I haven't noticed. Factory cow, 10 volts is wrong, got to use a cow, 10 volts is perfect. So that's right, so let's go down to 1 volt, this is showing us okay on here. 1 volt is reading a little bit low, factory calibration is reading a bit high. Auto zero, we'll turn that on, is that any better or worse? That's about the same as it should be, which means I've got the ranges about right. Go back to the utility again, back to where we were. So. That's one volt, let's do 100 millivolts. That's pretty close. I'm on 10 power line cycles. And factory calibration is really much lower. So we've got that one much closer. That's pretty much right, really. So 100 millivolts, let's do 10 millivolts. That's towards the bottom of the scaling. Because it's a 200 millivolt scale, 10 millivolts is towards the bottom of the scale, so it's a good one to check. 
and that's basically flicking up 10 millivolts as well so it's looking really good do the factory calibration and that's much lower so that's basically doing it once so what I might do is go up to 19 because that takes us much closer to the actual top end of the calibration range so doing 190 millivolts right now and we get 189.996 on the factory calibration user calibration 189.999 again this is just here for reference these aren't perfect either don't forget these are, do have a calibration error these aren't you can't really iron this 100 percent it's just here as a guide roughly just to verify things working correctly so let's do 1.9 volts it should also allow for a bit of settling time as well but we get the idea so we're slightly low on this one this is looking good, so I think we are slightly low on this one. Let's go back to factory calibration. So I think the one, well, the two volt range, I don't think I've got right. So factory calibration is now reading too high. So we're basically too low by the same amount as it's too high by. Okay, so we're really slightly off there, not a big deal. So we'll set 15 microvolts, 10 volt range. So it should be doing 19 volts. So we're sitting slightly low there. Now, as the gears are warming up, it's actually drifting closer, so maybe if I waited another couple of hours, then these readings might actually be a bit better. They might actually be about right. I did notice it was drifting up gradually as it's warming up. That's not bad, is it? That's 50 microvolts down on that one. Let's go back to factory calibration, and that's 400 microvolts up. User calibration is closer. Again, this cannot be completely trusted. This is third party calibrated, but I don't trust calibration. It's close, but it does have errors. I'd actually find some gross errors on it, where it's completely wrong one range. So yeah, they miss some stuff, which means I don't trust it. Okay, 190 volts, which is getting close to the maximum I can do on this thing. Turn it back on. Now it's gonna beep, but 190 volts, it's reading slightly high. Factory calibration, reading very low. Okay, again, our calibration is much closer. Probably well within spec, actually. Even other reading, which is off by a bit, it's probably in spec. I should actually check that against specs. Okay, so what I've got to do now, because this is going above the maximum this can do, it's going to do 300 volts on this. I'm going to have to disconnect this unit and then I shall carry on do some high voltage stuff. Okay, so if I unplugged the cable from here, plugged it into here, just tied it up, means you've got two cables going to it, shouldn't matter. Reading's exactly the same, no change. So let's increase this voltage, so let's put this down to zero range and go to 1000 volt range, 100 volts at a time. Make sure the output's on. So we go. Let's go to say 500 volts. Let's turn it off again. There we go, 500 volts, reading slightly low, looking good on this one though. Factory calibration is very low on there. Right, so again, our calibration is much closer. Let's go up to say 800 volts. Again, very slightly low, three counts low, looking very close on there though. So let's go back to factory calibration on that point, and that's much lower. So. Our calibration is definitely looking a lot better. Again, if I go back to the auto zero option, let's see what it does. No change. So that's working exactly fine. That's bang on. The values are exactly right between the two ranges, two modes. That's good, I'm happy with that. So here's my suggestion for Siglant on how to improve the calibration process on these SDM meters. It's a really simple idea. Now obviously it's going to take a bit of work to implement it, but I think it's a really good idea. Mainly because I thought of it. <laughs> You've got the calibration menu already in there. You've got all these spare buttons here. Now I think what you should actually have maybe as well is another calibration option. So you could have cold calibration, hot calibration or something like that. So you can got, so from start you can have a, a adjusted calibration so it allows for the meter being cold. And then now say less than one hour or something or greater than two hours, or something like that, you can have, I don't know, that's beside the point, that's not really what I'm talking about right now. I'm talking about in-meter calibration. 
So you've all these spare positions over here. You could say, have this button here allocated to perform calibration. You could push that and it would go into a calibration mode within the meter. And then you could choose which range you want to do. Choose the mode. You can push mode up here. Go to which mode you want to calibrate. Choose the range on the existing buttons. And you've got the arrow keys and everything over here. Right? You could use these to do the calibration in the meter. Dead easy. All you've got to do is say, inject a, a known level, which say in my case I'm doing 200 millivolts plus or minus a little bit. And this is just for demonstration purposes only. This is a pretty good device, but it's not got enough resolution right now for this, which is why it's an error. The idea is in calibration mode on that range, so you can choose a range you want, like a 200 milliwatt range right now. It could know that I'm doing a top end of the range, based on say 25% and 75% of the range. So you could choose less than 50 millivolts, in this case, to set the bottom end of the range, the calibration point for that, and above 150 millivolts, you can set the calibration point for that. Potentially. I don't know, maybe you won't allow for anywhere, but I suppose you could trim it at any point, but obviously at the end it's going to be better. You could then use his arrow keys here. You could use the left and right buttons here to move the cursor across the display. You can have a highlighted digit, and you could choose which digit is highlighted. Let's say tune that digit there, for example. We're going to move the cursor over, select that digit, and you can use the up and down keys to adjust the reading on the display. When you're actually in that mode, you have a store button or a discard button. If you want to discard the calibration you just did, you know, that particular range, you could ignore it so it doesn't do anything. Or you can do a store, which then commits that to memory, and that becomes a calibration point for that range in that mode. And you can do it range by range. You don't have to calibrate every range. You can just calibrate your ones you want to do. No reason why you couldn't do that. And that means you could really easily do in-meter calibration, no, nothing more than selecting the mode, selecting the range, and using arrow keys here. And then, you know, obviously, once you've done that calibration range, you go to the next range. Calibrating that one, you know, bottom end, top end. I want to do two volts on that one, for example. Do two volts on that range, and you do the same thing. Move the arrow keys around, tweak the reading on the display to match the calibration source, store it, done. Then you do the next one. And then you could choose which ranges and which modes you want to do it in. You don't have to do every mode, you don't have to do every range. You can do what's available to you. Like if someone's only got one of these things, then you can calibrate up to 10 volts. Anything other than that, you can't do it on that, but you know, if you've got better gear, you could do it. You know, this is what I'm thinking here, is that this is a really good way of doing in-meter calibration. It'd be really simple to implement, I think. You just tell it which mode, which range, and do it in meter using arrow keys. It can just trim the readings internally in the flash. Easy. That's my recommendation, Siglant. I reckon you should do it. I reckon it'd be much better than using the spreadsheet and the Excel file stuff and trying to go backwards and forwards and tweak it a little bit. You can do it all on screen. It could be so much easier. Like I said, you could have multiple calibrations in this option here as well, where you've got these spare menu buttons. You could actually have like two or three potentially, so you could choose which ones you want to use, rather than just factory and user. Definitely keep the factory calibration, that's really good, so you can always go back to factory. Another thing as well, Siglant, the current calibration procedure has a bug. This is rather important. You have to make sure you're on factory calibration first. If you're using a user calibration, right, if I'm on user calibration for this, if I then go in and load the calibration file, it will offset by the wrong amount because it's basing it off the existing user calibration, not off the factory calibration. So it's expecting it to be from the calibration of the factory, not the user one. So if you're trying to do a calibration procedure on here, you should always make sure it's on factory calibration first. And that's something which needs to be mentioned in the manual and the documentation saying, factory calibration first, base the references off this. Because if you're using an existing user calibration, it will miscalibrate it and cause you kinds of problems. Okay, that's something you need to cover. Please implement in-unit calibrations using those buttons. Dead easy to do, be far better. Much better, much simpler system. Anyone will be able to do it. Lots of brands do in-meter calibrations. Lots of brands do. You can just tweak the values on the screen and it matches what your calibration source is. Lots of brands do it. HP, Keysight, you know. Lots of equipment does it. Just do it. Thumbs up, channel interesting. Subscribe. Share the video to people which might want to know how to calibrate one of these meters or the 3055 or the 3045, the price is the same. Subscribe especially, very important to subscribe. Comment down below, have a chat down below, any comments you've got anything to contribute, anything I'm doing stupidly wrong, anyone that's used to metrology, much more experienced or professional metrologists, please tell me what exactly I'm doing wrong because I'm sure I'm doing stuff wrong with this. Maybe the whole multiple meters in parallel thing you're going to complain about that. But I've already demonstrated it made no difference to the readings in this situation. Bye.